Hello, everyone. Um, can I please check if you can see me and hear me? If, if, and if someone could just write in the chat to make sure we're live. Yes, perfect, great. Okay, so welcome to our Green Corridors event. Um, we're so happy to have you here tonight. I'm Flori, I'll be the host for the evening. Um, we have some brilliant talks coming up, so we really hope you will enjoy them. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to make a few pointers on the webinar and how the evening will proceed. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there is an option for Q&A and then an option for chat. Um, so please use the Q&A section if you have any questions for our speakers. Um, and then feel free to use the chat section for general comments and to engage with the other participants. Also, please note that um, part of the Zoom features, you can either message all panelists or the panelists and attendees. So that means you would be messaging everyone. Um, we will try to take as many as, um, questions as possible tonight. Um, if we don't get to go through all of them, we'll make sure we compile answers for you and send them as part of the follow-up of the event. Also, if you would like to engage on the online conversation, um, you can find us on Twitter at London NPC and on Instagram at London National Park City. We will be using the hashtag Green Corridors and then um, hashtag National Park City. So um, before we dive into the content, um, I will be giving a quick overview of the National Park City. Um, so Ed, thank you very much. My colleague Ed is helping us with tech today. Um, so I'm going to try and condense six years of history in five minutes. It might be seven minutes. Um, I'm very aware that some of you might have heard uh, this story because you've been uh, on, on the journey with us. Um, and But I'm also mindful that for some of you, it's the first time you're hearing about London National Park City. Um, so if you've heard this story 50 times before, um, you have a few minutes to grab a cup of tea. Um, so I'll start um, by introducing you to our friend Dan. Um, after he walked across the UK 69 cities and 50 national parks, um, he started asking, why can't cities be national parks? And they can't for reasons I'm not going to go into now. Um, but despite setback, he just changed the pitch. What if, what if we declared London as a national park city? Um, so something inspired by our beautiful rural national parks, but fitting for a city where, you know, many of us live and work. Um, he was imagining it not as a designation, but more as a celebration and a call to action. So this is how the National Park City idea was born. Um, we described the National Park City as a place, a vision, and a movement. The place in this example is Greater London, and the vision is to make the city greener, healthier, and wilder. Um, we want to make more of the city green, to connect more people to nature, and to promote the identity of the National Park City so we can catalyze more positive environmental action. Um, over the past five years, we developed a proposal for the London National Park City, um, and we campaigned a lot, winning support of people, businesses, politicians. We went word to word around London, speaking at events and lobbying, um, and we set our own targets for the amount of the support we needed. Why not? There was no precedent. So um, we did want the support from the majority of the London Assembly and from all of the candidates running to be mayor at the time, as well as over 200 businesses and charities. So in 2015, somewhere along that campaign journey, we established the London National Park City Foundation. 
In July 2019, over one year ago, as part of a week-long festival that saw over 300 events take place in London, we had the party at City Hall where the mayor, Sandeep Khan, alongside all sorts of other really important stakeholders, helped us to declare that London was the world's first national park city. We are lucky with our baseline because London is much greener than many people assume. I personally didn't know this either. Um, it's 47% uh, physically green with 3.8 million gardens, 8.3 million trees, 3,000 species, 30,000 allotments, 3,000 parks, 300 farms, and I could just go on. But the point is we know we can do better. I could point to loads of things we could do better. Pre-COVID, according to surveys, one in seven children in London has not been taken to a park by their parent in a whole year. We know that engagement with nature is not equal, that age, income, and ethnicity do impact on levels of nature engagement. We also know that environmental concern is mainstream but that pro-environmental behavior is not, and that we have much more to do. So our movement has taken us so far, but we need to grow it further to really deliver on this mission and vision. Um, and there are many ways in which you can get involved. Um, you can join one of our online events and gatherings. You can volunteer, you can be a maker, you can sign our charter, um, you can persuade your business to support. Um, you can also get involved with our developer forum or our schools forum, um, or just connect with one of our rangers that, um, um, live next to next to where you live um, or where you work. Um, also, with the support of Timberland, we now have 54 rangers across the city um, working to initiate National Park City project, like this urban greening project in Thornton Heat in the London Borough of Croydon, which was championed for us by the hip hop artist Loyal Carner. Um, we think we can all imagine a greener future, so let's try and deliver it together. Um, everybody's welcome. Leadership can come from anywhere. Um, we would really like this movement to be representative of Londoners, but also I'm mindful that today um, we're joined by people living in other cities across the world and we have speakers who have successfully implemented um, green corridors. So the invitation is for you to join this journey wherever you are. Um, so that was the main driver behind hosting this e event and exploring such an important topic as green corridors. Um, I'm personally very excited to listen to the talks today, to learn and be inspired. So I hope you are too. Um, good luck to all the speakers, and I just wanted to give a special thanks to my colleague Ed, um, who is um, also a ranger co uh, coordinator um, with myself, um, and he will be managing the tech today, so hopefully everything flows smoothly. Um, and I also wanted to thank Regina Vetter. She's one of our rangers, um, and she has helped us to, to make this um, event happen. Um, so Regina, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Flori, for the introduction and for, yeah, a quick introduction to myself. So my name is Regina Fetter. I'm, like Flori mentioned, one of the, I think, 54, around 54 um, rangers in the National London National Park City Program. So we are a group of um, volunteers, artists, urbanists, activists, athletes, um, teachers, all, all different kind of people coming together and we're all passionate group of Londoners and collaborating on um, finding solutions, exploring solutions for um, making our London a more uh, greener place to live in. So in my day job though, I work with cities globally on climate change adaptation at C40 Cities, which is an organization that connects around 95, uh, 97 cities around the world to collaborate on different climate change topics. So um, in my personal, but then also in my professional life, I'm, um, yeah, I'm very passionate about what nature does in cities and all the many co-benefits that nature has in our cities. So for better air quality, to increase physical, but also mental health, increased biodiversity, carbon capture, and of course, also to adapting to hotter temperatures and flooding events. So I'm very excited to um, introduce to you this topic today, Green Corridors, and also our amazing speakers from around the world. 
So um, yeah, why are we here? Why are we talking about green corridors? What are green corridors? Um, the concept, and I'm pretty sure our um, speakers will go into two, way more details there, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But just um, kind of the idea of green corridors is to not see urban nature as kind of isolated spots in the city, but rather as a genuine network of green areas and green spaces. So these green corridors can be stripes with kind of high concentration of vegetation in the city, and they're used mainly by pedestrians and cyclists. And the aim is really to form kind of a functional network of green spaces um, to ensure the connectivity for us humans that we can walk around in connected green spaces, but also for wildlife. And many cities from around the world have embraced this concept and are either through bottom up or through kind of planning, um, implementing green corridors in all kind of sizes and shapes. And we'll hear from three cities today. We'll hear from Medellin, Lisbon and London. Um, so I'm very honored to introduce to you our first speaker, who's actually a colleague of mine, uh, Paola in Medellin. Um, so she works for C40's Climate Action Planning Program. And she worked um, previously in public administration for Medellin City as an environmental engineer in the environment secretary, and she worked to co coordinate international coordination. And a big shout out to Medellin, who since 2016 has started creating these Corredores Verdes um, across the city. And it's really an inspiring project um, that sees how kind of nature-based policies like kind of widespread urban tree planting can have really far reaching impact. Um, not just on the environment, but also on the people living alongside those green corridors. So Paula, I'm happy to hand it over to you. And uh, thanks, Regina. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for introduction. Uh, I just want to share with you just um, example of what we are doing here in Medellin. Uh, this project has from today four years, and I, I just want to to see the context of this picture. As you can see, the, um, the neighbor where is um, the houses of this neighbor is in a is pure neighbor in Medellin. And in these kind of neighborhoods, as you can imagine, is high density, a lot of population, and they don't have a lot of green spaces close to them. So I want to show you how we make this kind of transformation in, in a city. Next, please. So I just want to give you a little bit um, um, to let you know where we are located. So uh, I can, can imagine Colombia is in, the, in South America. We are a tropical country. And um, as you can imagine, our weather is, and my city is the always a spring city. So the weather is very nice, almost around 24, 25 degrees average. And so we are located in the mountain, in the mountains here. So Medellin has a valley who cross the river from south to north. And around them, we have a very high mountains. We are located most of the uh, poorest neighbors in the city. So uh, consider this uh, next slide, please. In the last 50 years, we had a rapid urban development and also with this reason, Medellin has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, impermeability uh, soil to make the, to change the function. And this is implication, of course, in the superficial temperature. In this map, you can see the hot spot that we have in the Medellin. Most of them are located in the lower, lower part of the city which is the, the most flat part, and which are the most concentrated part of the population. Uh, Medellin is a medium, or compared to, to London, is a small city, but for us is the second most important city in Colombia. And uh, sometimes when we, very, very, when we have very high temperature, we can have 35 degrees. So consider this, um, the Medellin has to thinking about the, how can make greener our city. Even though Medellin is green because we have some hills, like you can see very green spaces here because what we have like uh, five important hills. And these hills, the idea is to connect them with the rural area of Medellin, which are in the green part. Next, please. 
So with this concept, um, the city start to thinking and planning to make uh, at the beginning was 30 green corridors. One of them are located close to the main street, which idea is to, um, to reduce the temperature, the, the sensation of temperature that people can feel it when they walk. And the other were located close to the river, in the riverside. As you can see, the target was 30, and at the end of the administration, they, they made more than that target. And also important thing to say is this uh, green corridor was made by, by, the, by the, for the municipality, but for two different offices. One of them was the physical infrastructure secretary, and the other one was environmental secretary. Maybe you can uh, have the question why, and the reason is because is the two the function the green, the green areas in the city are split in two offices, uh, because the green areas located close to the river or close to the creeks is part of the function of the environmental secretary, but the other green areas located in another part, like parks, like uh, close to the streets, and are the function for the physical infrastructure secretary. Next, please. So I just want to show you how it looks like one of the main streets in the in Medellin. This is in the downtown. We call it a, El Centro de Medellin. And this is the Oriental Avenue. This avenue um, have a lot of traffic, not in the pandemic uh, scenario nowadays, but Usually we have a lot of traffic in this zone, and the one is the one is one of the most populated zone in the city. On the other important thing is, in this part we are they are located a lot of um, office universities, and a, it's a very commercial zone. So statistics say that around one people cross the downtown through one day. So I want to show you how in the, if you. If you see here in the middle where the trees are located, the trees are very in very bad um, um, condition. And they have these concrete pyramids, which give, which um, are make the space more harder or more hot. So I just want to look how it looks before and how it looks nowadays. Next, please. And uh, with this, we take off these concrete pyramids and we make first uh, like um, urban forest because we have in the vertical different status. In the lower, we have like uh, gardens, a lot of. And the other thing is in Medellin, we have a lot of different kind of trees and small um, plants. So this is uh, the biodiversity that we have is um, one of the, our advantage, so we can um, plant a different kind of them. Next, please. This is one um, I'll show you before and after. This is how it looks before. And please, next one. Yeah, this is like, yeah, this is the difference. And also this kind of corridors makes, they have the another function is one of the temperature for the people, but also have the, in a natural function because um, this acts like a corridor for the avifauna or like for birds and for also for small mammals that we have. And also we, we facilitate the pollinization in function in, in this zone. Next, please. So as you can see, we have also there are other um, green corridors like this one. Here is we mix the green corridors along in the this is in the this is the metro, and um, above we made some cycle infrastructure to facilitate and to give the people who use bicycle better condition to use the bicycle because as I told you this is a tropical country so. Sometimes the temperatures are, are high. In this process, we have uh, planted more than 10,000 trees 
and 65 hectares. And with these corridors, if we make an average, how was before and how it looks nowadays, we can say that um, two degrees is have been the reduction in the heat island effect. Next, please. Also an important social part of this project has been the, because uh, when we made green, uh, green corridors, it's also, it's not only the, the when you're planting, but you also you have to maintain this to these green corridors. So we have um, training more than 20, 75 local people who have been in a disadvantaged backgrounds and they were training to be a gardens. So they are like, they have a, like a technical preparation to make this uh, labor very, very well. So this is our permanent gardeners that we have in the city to make the maintenance of this. And they belong to the botanical garden, Joaquin Antonio Uribe here. Next, please. And also this is a part that I want to tell you. This is another kind of, um, we call it here in Medellin, like a, a tour city or urbanist tour because we make very specific projects in a very um, specific zone. Like you can see, here's one of the um, more designated uh, neighbors is called a uh, Comuna dos, is um, close to one river called El Mister. It's not possible to see it, but how is it look the zones before? And the people um, here in Medellin, we have like um, a, a, um, a chance because the citizens have one part of the budget of the city to choose what do you want to do in your neighbor with this budget. So the people vote for which project they want to, to promote and they vote in for make gardens in these places. So I want to show you how it looks nowadays. This is how it looks. And also it's important because um, maybe you don't know, but here in Medellin, we have a lot of uh, social conflicts. And sometimes we have like invisible boundaries. And for example, here is one good example because this, as you can see, they are very, um, it looks like the same neighbor but the river separate these two neighbors and one people um, shouldn't cross the other one, the two social conflicts. And with this project, we make also social um, activities to, to reduce the tension and make the people can cross to one neighbor to another without any problem. So this also connects, um, this space also connects the people and we try to make a um, different relationship between the citizens and the nature. Next. This is another example. Is it the Villa del Socorro, is one neighbor? Ne next. And this is how it looks nowadays. And all the thing is the people helps to maintain the, these green corridors. The people clean them to also to, um, planting or they take care that no one destroyed this part, for example. Chain. Uh, next, please. So wider benefits of green corridors is decreased exposure to high temperatures, reduce mortality, reduce stress, uh, improve air quality, biodiversity protection, reduce greenhouse houses emission, job creation and increase labor productivity and reduce crime because these places have become like a more pieces, peace places so the people can cross and they can have a different kind of relationship with the other people. Yeah, next. And with C40, we are uh, participate on one project to uh, identify the co-benefits but quantity, because it sometimes is um, the city does, doesn't have the in quantity or doesn't know the numbers of how we have been the benefits of them of this kind of projects. And for example, with this tool, if we, for example, see the scenario with RCP 8.5, which is, is a more extreme, 
compared to RCP 2.6, we can uh, see that we are going to have with this green corridor 68 days fewer of um, above the threshold. And also we can see the benefits with uh, health and I comment impact. So yes, this is what I want to share with you this time. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Paola. Thanks so much for your presentation. And in times of where we only uh, can travel in our minds from our living rooms, this has been highly inspirational and beautiful to look at the pictures from Medellin. Um, there's a, if you have questions for Paola, we're gonna go to the next presentation, but we're gonna collect questions. Um, and after the next one, have a joint Q&A. So if you have questions for Paola, please put them in the Q&A. There's a little button that says Q&A. And if you put them in there, we will um, read them out and ask them, Paula, after the next presentation. So then let's come to the next speaker. And again, I'm very happy to introduce Peter Massini from London. Um, and he has been for the past 10 years, um, has been leading on green infrastructure and natural environment policy for the Greater London Authority, where he successfully implemented and embedded a policy framework in the London plan and also the London environment strategy that aims to make London a greener, more livable, more resilient city. So obviously we're all very curious to hear from Peter about um, how London is thinking about green corridors and the efforts of the city. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Regina. And first of all, apologies, my, my room's a bit dingy here, so it's not, not very much light in here. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some of the sort of strategic policy and some of the strategic frameworks for green corridors in London. And um, I guess the first thing to say, if you go into the next slide, is that uh, London's um, has the benefit of having a major corridor that runs right through the middle of the city, which is common to many cities. It's not a green corridor, it's a blue corridor, but the River Thames is quite pivotal in shaping uh, the rest of London and shaping London's green corridors. Because uh, if you go on to the next slide, London's effectively uh, a large uh, river basin and with an amazing network of rivers, some still extant, some now lost to drainage, but that network of rivers is where London's parks network is largely um, located. So if you look at a map of London, many of the major parks in London are located around those, those river corridors, the existing river corridors and some of the lost river corridors. So London's uh, floodplain and its river network is fundamental to that network of green corridors. And I guess the other important thing to say is that London's had a long history of town planning, which has put green space and green corridors at the heart of the planning system. This is the um, open space plan for the County of London plan, the so-called Abercrombie plan, which was actually produced between 1943 and 1945. So it was actually produced during the uh, height of the Second World War. And it was a vision for London post-war. And on that map, which is mostly central London, you can see all the dark green areas are proposals for new parks. And it's a, a ring of connected parks. And many of those parks are actually uh, established. Uh, Mile End Park and Burgess Park were a consequence of the Abercrombie plan, taking the, taking the opportunity of the terrible de devastation of the Blitz to create new green spaces in parts of London, which were previously uh, large areas of back-to-back uh, -back housing. So that concept of a parks network and a connected parks network has been extant in London planning policy for almost 100 years. If you move on to the next slide. And um, about 15 years ago, we developed that even further into the All London Green Grid. And that's now been the sort of spatial planning framework for London's green space for the last 15 years. Envisaging London as this network of interconnected green spaces. Again, many of those green spaces and connections and corridors along the existing river valleys, uh, but also identifying opportunities for new connections, new corridors, not just for wildlife to connect up habitats of wildlife, but opportunities for people to uh, uh, walk, 
from areas of high density into the green belt, into areas of metropolitan local land and into some of London's fantastic uh, natural areas. And uh, that's gradually being implemented, that concept of an interconnected network green space gradually being implemented. So just some examples of how that's been put in place. And that happens at a variety of scales. And, and the, the biggest example of a, a new green connection, a new green corridor was the opportunity realised when the Olympic Olympics came to London. So that provided an opportunity to take a part of East London around Stratford, which was an area of uh, railway sidings, um, uh, canalised rivers, uh, logistics sheds, uh, waste disposal sites, and create uh, a vital green connection linking the bottom end of the Lee Valley down the River Lee into, into the River Thames. So you click on one more. And creating a, you know, a huge new green corridor on Parkland uh, through uh, East London. Um, a really transformative um, approach to uh, greening a city. But the most important thing about this project was it, it wasn't the creation of a park. Um, although it's called the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, it's not really a park in a traditional sense. It's much more an interconnected piece of infrastructure, a piece of green infrastructure that prevents flooding downstream. This can actually fill up with flood water during really uh, high rainfall events. But the space was designed to enable walking and cycling, not just into the park, but through the park. So it becomes part of that hub of active travel networks, cycling, walking infrastructure that enables people to cycle through a green corridor, a nice area of open space on their way to school, on their way to the shops or on their way to work. So it's thinking much more about a green corridor as a functional piece of landscape without boundaries, um, which is slightly different from the traditional concept of a park, which usually has a sort of fence boundary, is a, is a destination place, a place you visit, rather than a piece of infrastructure which serves multiple functions. So next slide. Um, and we can also improve green corridors in areas which are already green. Um, there are large parts of London's green space network, um, which are largely uninspiring green spaces. Uh, they're great places to walk the dog or, or play football um, and have some ecological value, but they can be significantly enhanced. And the, again, the concept of a green corridor and thinking through uh, the opportunities of restoring some of those lost rivers provides opportunities to enhance these green corridors. This is uh, First Farm Wetlands in uh, Ealing uh, and a project which created a brand new wetland green corridor. So if you click on again, that space had a, a, a river in a pipe beneath it, uh, and that river was liberated from its pipe and a series of new wetlands created, if you click on one more, that creates a much more interesting uh, space for uh, recreation and for enjoying nature. Uh, it provides flood defense downstream. This, this project protected 200 homes from, from flooding. Uh, and alongside the new uh, river corridor, uh, there's a new walking and cycle route which connects a uh, 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 housing estate with, with the local school. So creating green corridors in areas which are already uh, green space. Next slide, please. Uh, and at a very local scale, a very granular scale, thinking through that notion of connectivity, not just connectivity for wildlife, but connectivity for people, thinking differently about our street network and what that street network is for and rather being a space that's dominated always by cars and vehicles can be reconnected to the green space network to provide walking and cycling routes that allows people to walk and cycle away from main roads uh, through bits of green space again to the high street to the shops to the doctor surgery you click on one more Those, those connections through, through, the, um, to, through the green space network alongside the green space network, which encourages people to move away from polluted streets, encourages uh, that active travel, which is beneficial for health and well-being. Um, again, I think if, if this project was done again, we'd also think differently about the, um, the fenced park next door and perhaps remove that fence and actually creating it into a bigger open connected green space. 
But again, it's always thinking about the opportunities for connections and using uh, green infrastructure to create connections that benefit wildlife, but also create inviting spaces for people to uh, see different parts of the city, to use spaces for their health and well-being, and to move away from the most polluted spaces, even more important uh, on the back of uh, COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and it's also important to think about green corridors as not necessarily always as linked features. Um, a lot of the work that was done by the former London College Unit looking at green corridors also thought, to, thought about the, the um, opportunity for, for stepping stones and, and, and other green links, uh, the principles of ecology uh, in an urban environment. So again, this is the Olympic Park and if you come across this space, it looks like a fantastic um, wildlife area, a, a, a pond that's great for dragonflies and newts, um, which it is. Um, if you click onto the next slide, it's actually the end point of a sustainable drainage scheme. So this development, the high density development, and uh, uh, we have to do high density development in London if we're going to protect our existing green space and the green belt. Um, but it incorporates a sustainable drainage scheme, which includes the green roofs, which capture some of the rainwater, then gently infiltrates that into the green space below, then into a swale, eventually into that pond network, uh, which then discharges into, into the River Lee. So thinking about green corridors, uh, not just as physical uh, links for wildlife and people, but also for the wider ecology, how move how water moves through the urban landscape, which adds to the ecology uh, of the area. Um, one final slide. Uh, and recognizing the opportunity of using roof space. Again, not physically linked, but if you're a, a bee or a dragonfly or a, a, a beetle that can fly, um, you can use these spaces as stepping stones. Uh, between different areas of habitat and lots of invertebrates who use these kind of landscapes are quite happy to use ephemeral landscapes, isolated landscapes, as long as there are multiple areas of habitat within a th three or 400 meter radius. So they don't actually need to be physically connected. So we need to think about green corridors as stepping stones as well as corridors. Fine side, thank you. And I'm interested to hear the questions and discussion uh, later on, thank you. Great, thank you, Peter, for your presentation and again for so many inspiring before and after pictures of, of our green spaces in London. Um, some really good questions are coming in. I've just been looking at the chat box. So again, if you have questions for Peter, please put them as well in the Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll be, we probably don't have time to cover all of them right now, but we have a panel discussion afterwards where we can pick on some of the topics that you mentioned in the Q and A's. So maybe one for Paula, um, which is around kind of, um, organization or kind of governance of the green corridors in Medellin. How did the two ministries get buy-in from the rest of Medellin's leadership and administration? And was there resistance to the green corridors, especially, for example, on paying on grounds of costs? And if yes, how did they overcome it? So, yeah, for example, the maintenance of the green corridors are, the budget is com complete from the municipality, from both secretaries, and also is continued through the administration because the citizens have a lot of, um, they love them. So this is one of the projects that the people like to show and talk about this. So it's like a more active city, uh, citizens who makes this project don't finish through when they have the change of administration. So they continue. For example, this year that we have the new mayor in the city. Great, thanks. Um, then maybe one for Peter in the meantime. Um, from Nick, what specific species are we encouraging to be able to move between areas of London through the green corridors? How are we monitoring that? And are we linking with gardeners as well? Um, oh, there's a whole variety of species that can use some of these corridors. It depends <laughs> on which species of habitat are being linked up. So um, things like water voles, I mean, a lot of the river restoration schemes in London are creating new habitat for water voles. And water voles are a species that's declined significantly across the wider countryside. But, hangs on in some urban fringe areas because of the um, reduced number of, of mink which predate on water bowls. Um, 
there, there is an opportunity to link in with gardeners and gardens can create fantastic wildlife corridors. Um, uh, but that's very much about trying to um, promote local objectives because um, it's quite difficult to set up a sort of strategic program of garden interventions because they're private gardens and people choose to manage their gardens differently. So you may have two or three gardens which are fantastic for wildlife. And then the next garden's a astroturf lawn with a, with a trampoline in it. So um, there's lots of advice from people like London Wild Trust about how you can improve gardens. But if you want to create um, connected corridors for particular species of wildlife, it's, it's often best to focus on, on uh, the sort of publicly owned land or land that can be managed in a more long-term strategic way. Having said that, you know, any gardens uh, with some vegetation is, is great for uh, sort of common species of wildlife, you know, common birds and, and, and bats and those kind of things. Great, thanks. Um, one for Paula, and I think to pick up on something you mentioned in the presentation, um, really like to know more about the impact on reduced crimes. I don't know if you can talk a bit around kind of the impacts of kind of creating a sense of space in the area of people taking care of it and also what impacts that has on, on reduced crime in Medellin. I think you're on mute. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, the thing is, um, most of the parts in the Medellin, in some neighborhoods, we have, as I told you, these invisible boundaries. And sometimes the, there are some uh, part of these zones that uh, were used for throughout your garbage or, and in these places that the people don't use it or they don't have a house or a park or something else, they, um, they legally and the um, thieves of the people who consume drugs, they use this place because the citizens don't use it. So part of this make this uh, green transformation is to change the function of these places. So if you just have these places that where people throw away your garbage, they don't have any more these places. So they have to use the correct places to throw out your garbage or the people who um, like these lonely, isolated places. So when we make, um, make these gardens and we pay, put on them a play in like among children, Juegos de Niños, I don't know how to say that in English. Yeah, in playground. Yeah. So the people start to use it in a different way. So the families go there. And it's, this is how we make this uh, connection with the social effects and also with the reduction of crime. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much. And um, one last for Peter. Um, how managed are these green spaces? For example, the Olympic Park, are they becoming naturally wild green spaces or are they continually managed? Um, I mean, most green spaces are, are managed to some degree. Um, I mean, I've worked in London for 30 years now and um, the transformation in parks has been incredible in terms of thinking much more in terms of ecological uh, management of parks. So when I first started working in London, I worked for London Wildlife Trust and we were there protecting sort of areas of natural habitat and parks were not particularly wildlife rich because they were managed in quite traditional ways. In the last 20 years, most local authorities are now significantly changing the way they manage parks to ensure they are as wildlife rich as possible. Clearly in public parks, there's many competing uses, um, formal sports, ecology, uh, passive recreation. Um, so um, it's it's a challenge, but uh, I think there are some excellent examples of parks which are now managed with ecological principles in mind. And even some of the central London parks, and if you go to St James's Park or uh, Hyde Park, you know there are huge areas now which are managed with wildlife in mind, which was not the case uh, 20 years ago. Great. Thanks so much, both Peter and Paula. You can sit back and relax now when we hear from the other two speakers. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker and we're staying in London and we have another London perspective from Maya Pérez Muñoz, who is the founder of the Heston Action Group. Um, and she's working to unite local community in cleaning and greening to make the area a better place to live and work. And yeah, we're keen to hear from Mara of how she's working with local communities to build a greener London. Uh, yes, hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for giving us this um, opportunity to talk to you about uh, green corridors. 
Um, thank you, Flori, Ed, and, um, and Regina for introducing us. Um, the first time that we came across uh, London National Park City was during the uh, Walk for Wildlife uh, in Hyde Park in September 2018. Um, my husband and I were disguised as um, beekeepers. Um, Ed, if you want to put the next slide. Um, at the time, Heston Action Group was only half a year old and we have already achieved a bit of a steering in the local area. Um, Heston Action Group was born out of a mix of uh, hope and desperation. Um, desperation in seeing how the streets were very dirty and some of them very unkempt, seeing a few um, trees um, not well kept. Sorry, it's my son. I want to move because you're in the camera. <laughs> um, and um, so then uh, we, we got together with a dedicated um, number of individuals that we could create change through positive action and how um, and then to be able to meet like-minded people. So that desperation got away quite quickly when we started um, coming together and our motto was uniting to cleaning and greening. Um, in the aspect of the greening, this Heston Action Group got involved um, quite early on with a national uh, park city in the talks in summer 2018 um, what if, uh, where Alma, um, Michael and I, next slide please, um, did a short talk about what, um, what would be to have a connected London um, through green spaces. Um, we also then participated in the summit, summit of 2018 as well. And by the way, I'm a National Park City Ranger, which is a privilege to be part of. Um, as we can all see, we have seen um, that in the last 40 years or so, we have seen in cities um, a massive loss of verges and hedges. And we only need to look around for pictures of the old times. And we see that there's a, a loss of biodiversity, um, depletion of our wildlife. Um, and that is really one of the things that we want to, at a local level, um, be able to tackle. Um, all the things um, that we can see is the loss and interest in trees. I mean, how often do we see now kids climbing up trees or jumping um, around green spaces is, is not very common. Um, and one of the most obvious things that we've seen, and I'm sure everybody has seen, and Peter has shown a couple of um, slides on that, is the how driveways have become the norm. Front gardens are no longer um, one after another in, in row. We can see that driveways have taken over car, as, as car parks. Um, and as a group, Heston Action Group, we are united to, and we're planning uh, to clean and green, and we need to win minds and hearts individually. And this can be very challenging sometimes, and it can be um, when you're talking to people and say you want to be, uh, you want to water your front tree, your street tree, uh, sometimes you face with people that they're not really interested, but mostly they are really interested and they want to look after what, what green is in front of them. Um, however, we found that with social media, um, we are able to connect with other small groups who have similar passions, who have, who have similar interest and they have a purpose of, of greening the neighborhoods. And there are many community groups that are in London and everywhere in the world, I guess, um, that they have that very same purpose. Um, so they all have a green agenda. So there's a lot of groups like us, grass group groups um, with community gardens, um, ready to bring up the best of nature and urban landscape and to encourage their own communities to become more green. And um, what has connected all of us is our common interest and social media has been able to link it with us um, because we share information, we share experiences, we share the care for one another. Um, early on, we also found that Heston Action Group needed to go outside. So even though it's called Heston in Hounslow, we have been going in different um, uh, boroughs of, the, of, the, of London. 
in doing so, we have created what we call virtual green corridors um, that connect the micro green communities that are starting to grow and already grown and they tend to grow organically uh, with the share information, sharing of information, promoting each other to connect the council so what they can do and their partners and the stakeholders to bring about that change that we need to have um, in order to promote the increase of our green corridors. Uh, one good example of a potential green corridor is the, um, is the creation of the Great West Hedge. Great West Hedge, what an amazing idea, connecting Heston to Hammersmith. No, let's start. Sorry, I don't think I can, you can see the video. Um, so it's the previous one, Ed. The, the, the other one. <laughs> Sorry. So my daughter is still going to tell you a story right now. It's not working. Sorry. Um, so it's the uh, life. Based on the story that that we did in in 2018, 2019, and um, so Alma's story. Sorry, we can go from there. Great West Hedge. What an amazing idea! Connecting Heston to Hammersmith. The squirrel will be very happy with that, and for all us people, it will make the roads quieter the air cleaner, the town nicer, and it will be a habitat for lots of wildlife. My mum's story about the squirrel claimed that the squirrel could move from one part of Spain to another, never touching the ground. All thanks to my mum, who made a lovely group which helps the environment. <laughs> Thank you, Alma. Thanks very much. So this was this story was uh, meant to be told by my daughter in the, in the letter speech. Um, so going back to green corridors, now we think um, that we need to recover that vision of, of the cities and imagine that squirrel going from one part to another. Um, back to the Great West Hedge idea, um, this was a very, or is a very innovative and challenging proposal. Uh, to, and it was created to mark the launch of the London National Park City with a hedge along the Great West Road. Now, the Great West Road is starting in Hammersmith in West London. Um, and the idea is to bring a, a green corridor from, um, from Hammersmith all the way to Chiswick. And that would be a protective and attractive hedge, very much similar to what Paula was showing us earlier in one of the pictures. And it would be a protective hedge um, that would be preventing pollution coming into the pedestrians, making cycling easier, making the residents less uh, prone to ch um, chest problems and making a very visual impact for, for school ch children. Um, this will also provide more, more than just green. As mentioned before, it's, it will be um, heaven for, um, for wildlife and it will improve the street scene and potentially will filter some of the road, no um, road noise. Now, the idea of creating this um, corridor from Hammersmith to West London, Heston Action Group combined with other groups along the, along the Great West Road, um, we, because, uh, sorry, uh, Abundance London um, try, wanted to, to do the Great West Hedge, and we want to create an elongated the, uh, the, the hedge a little farther to go possibly all the way from Chiswick to, Hamas, uh, to um, Heathrow. And in doing so, then the idea would be to connect with smaller groups along the line, for instance, uh, Osterley Residents Association or uh, Crown for Action Group and, and different individuals that are interested to start putting pressure on, on the powers that be. So to enable us to create the Great West Hedge or the greatest West Hedge as I like to call it. Um, next um, slide, Ed. I think we have to join together. So um, as you can see, this is a very straight line and, and it would be really nice if we could create and preserve what I would like to call community hedge. 
so that if it's too expensive to maintain, local action groups could help the maintenance and the watering and the, and the preservation of these um, corridors. Um, so going back to the, to the uh, virtual grain corridors, um, we have more examples of, of how other groups can interact and, and help it possible, help it ma help in making a green corridor along the lines of, of groups and virtual communities. Um, we have connections, for instance, with the London Permaculture Network, who have we have connected with, with London and other groups doing permablitz um, activities around London, for instance, in Malden in the May Project Garden, in Rary Primary School in Lambeth, the Nubian Light Centre in Acton. And we have then, for instance, one doing a little picking event one day uh, on the Grand Union Canal, we bump into a festival of waste organized by Rin of the um, Friends of Carthia. And, and we then met a lot of people from Brentford who then will be part of the Great West Hedge once it's, uh, once it's, it's a possibility. But we don't want to stop um, uh, just in London. We think that green corridors are not just a path that connect trees and hedges. Um, we can also connect an international superhighway of networks that connect people and groups and we share the same values and the same interests and, and passions to repopulate the green infrastructure in each individual city by connecting each other as well. Um, for that, it takes everybody to be on board, to create from, from bottom to top. Um, in the same way that trees are, are, are kind of work and the, the roots work symbiotically with mycorrhizal fungi, um, with the bass wood wide web. And so we'll have uh, individuals, the green communities, umbrella groups like the London National Park City. And we can then that way create positive change. And if, in doing so, then we can inspire and can grow on that um, micro green community that needs to kind of come up to compensate for the lack of, um, of, of interest. So the, the green corridor, those are not just uh, um, a green path or a blue path, but it will also connect internationally minded people or internationally um, groups around the world. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Regina. Yeah, I'm just waiting for my unmute button to appear. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I mean, what an amazing grassroots project. And you have the whole family effort involved, squirrels involved in West London. They'll be very happy to be able to jump uh, from, from one green space to the next. So congratulations on a really great project. Um, and I've seen questions are, are coming in. So if you, again, if you have questions for Mar, please put them in the Q&A. And... Um, so many questions are coming in. So we're trying to answer many in the panel. Also, maybe our panelists can can type some of them while the others are speaking. So thanks so much for all your interest and your feedback. Um, but now to our next speaker, we are traveling to Lisbon. And I'm going to introduce to you Darte Marta, who is a landscape architect. And he's the head of the cabinet of the Deputy Mayor for Environment, Green Infrastructure, Climate and Energy in Lisbon for a couple of years, since 2015. And he's been involved in various international and European projects like European Green Capital Award, um, as well as with various citywide green infrastructure projects and climate adaptation. So Duarte, the floor is yours and um, tell us about Lisbon Green Corridors. Hello everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here with you in this, in this presentation, very inspirational. The, what I have uh, assisted so far. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, a little bit of contest about Lisbon. It's uh, we have uh, a city, unfortunately, with no uh, a metropolitan area uh, funded in a regional voting scheme. So we are still in Portugal with uh, very separated municipal policies in terms of the the two main metropolitan areas Lisbon and Porto this becomes uh, very old fashioned and, and and we have to to update this with the national government because now we are 
18 uh, different municipalities working sometimes not in the same direction. Nevertheless, in the last year, some uh, transport management policies and uh, climate adaptation studies have been worked in, in, in common. Next slide, please. In the in, next slide, please. So the, the, the thank you. No, it's, it's the previous one. Yeah, it's this one. So uh, the, what I was saying is that the metropolitan area, we have also al almost 3 million people, but only a half of a million lives in Lisbon, which means that we had more than four decades of uh, car centric policies that have spread it, as it happened in, in so many cities all across the world. And now we are in, in the last 10 years, we have created a different uh, um, in, in policies in terms of the municipal approach in trying to create uh, green infrastructure uh, across the city. Of course, as I have said, it, uh, based on the municipal approach. This picture can show you that how, how, how uh, important was the transforming the, the green spaces, the traditional and conventional green spaces that we had until the end of the, the, the 20th century in the city, based on parks and gardens and with uh, a few connectivity. And we have created and imported the, the conscience of the ecosystem service. And we have started uh, to create green corridors as a solution that can implement the ecosystem service based on nature-based solutions. And we are now working very hard on this, mapping the ecosystem service and working with clear environmental indicators in terms of, instead of creating recreational gardens and parks that are not uh, any more interesting and important in terms of the urban context. As you can see here in this slide, we, it makes big difference as well if we can implement nature-based solutions instead of conventional landscape uh, approach. As you can see here, if we go to the left of your slide, you see that extensive landscapes can provide much more uh, um, interesting ecosystem service. At the same time, they can provide very interesting social inclusion benefits for soil, air, active mobilities. And we can also implement uh, very uh, cost-effective solutions because nature-based solutions can be very cost-effective not only in, in the moment of the implementation, but also in, during the time when we have to spend lots of money in the maintenance. Next slide, please. The, I have to stress here that in the Southern European countries, we have a very specific uh, um, weather that we have all the, the rain concentrated between this time in the calendar from middle October to April, we have all 100% uh, of the rain uh, very concentrated, creating sometimes floods. And we, we have from middle April to October, we have, we have a very dry uh, season with uh, the urban heat island effect becoming more effective as all the, the climate studies are now showing us. And this created the, the, the basis, this climate adaptation uh, needs created the basis for the 2012 uh, update of the master plan that uh, opened the, um, the, the gateway for uh, a new concept for green corridors that you can see here in the slide. And this opened as the opportunity of making big uh, and continuous uh, green uh, infrastructure instead of isolated green parks as we done so in the previous uh, periods. And as you can see here, we have uh, created the, 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 uh, 
the scenarios for 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 nine green corridors and i will show you briefly one of these green corridors which was the first one we opened in 2012 and it is uh, marked uh, in in your screen uh, and it, it was very interesting landmark and open the opportunity to make the others that are now being open in the city. Next slide, please. So this nature-based uh, solution strategy is much wider than, than parks and gardens. And now you can see how we can we spread the nature-based solutions approach uh, uh, across the, the territory and, and with the focus on these main uh, typologies, rain-fed biodiversity meadows instead of irrigated lawns, very important to tackle the, the, um, the water scarcity uh, episodes. The ecological depuration in lakes, we are now using in several lakes in the city to, to, to remove pollutants for, from the water with based on plants. The urban allotment gardens policy, uh, the natural drainage solutions that we are using in the green infrastructure to based on natural uh, land movements, uh, we are now uh, tackling the, the floods and the massive tree planting that we are implementing to reduce the, um, the, the urban heat island effect. And we are using, including the Alive project to support these, these uh, these massive interventions along the city. Next slide, please. This is a picture of uh, the Urban Allotment Gardens program. This is an example of some of the, 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 mo the most iconic parks in, in, in Lisbon. These two examples uh, are showing that now we have started since 2011 with uh, 20 uh, places for uh, implementing the urban agriculture in the city. But we have created uh, a strategy that we have designed a guidelines that we can replicate uh, a standard design across the land with no implications um, with the, the neighborhoods in terms of bad qualities of the public space. That was uh, the frequent uh, motive that lots of people didn't like the urban farmers in the city because they use plastics and lots of garbage and we have decided to implement um, a guideline that could create a very good quality in in the public space and we are using this as a very cheap and social inclusive way of implementing and creating new green across the city and this is very interesting because we we have attracted new people to the parks because it, it increased in, in, uh, inclusive the, the public awareness, the safety and the surveillance in the park, because there is always people in the park. We have created public tenders and we give the, um, uh, the priority for those who live very close to the parks. We have uh, parcels that uh, varies from 80 square meters to 150 square meters. And we, we want to we target to reach 25 urban allotment gardens next year, uh, around 1,000 families. And it is a 10 years uh, process, so it's very new. Next uh, slide, please. You have here some image of the urban allotment gardens in your right slide uh, before and after the intervention. And the park is very, very, very climate uh, integrated with, with flowering and not spending water and bio, lots of biodiversity across the year, including the urban allotment, because it's possible to transform the plots in biodiversity spots. In your left, uh, uh, side of the slide, you see how we are making nature-based solutions in drainage, creating basins to retain water, rainwater, and they, uh, putting the, um, the process in the nature as the, the uh, very cost-effective process to, to retain water and uh, remove and reduce uh, problems in, in downtown areas. Next slide, please. Another very interesting process we are implementing and we have imported this for the university. This was a LIFE 2003 winning project, the rain-fed biodiversity medius. 
It was awarded by the European Climate Commission as a climate tool, and we are replacing some irrigated lawns by a biodiversity solution that is rain-fed, it's free from water and nitrogen because it is also a very interesting carbon and nitrogen uh, caption and uh, in soil, directly in soil. And we have only to have the careful in the maintenance because people don't like this brown uh, picture that you have seen here. It corresponds to, to the summer. And, and of course, it's, it, it is very important to have this with a very, very interesting and care design, landscape design, the traditional landscape Portuguese landscape can solve this, and we are now importing this to the city, these countryside solutions that are being spread into the city. Next slide, please. This is an image of the, the one of the latest, more impressive campaigns to plant trees under the European Green Capital uh, um, year that we are living now in, in the city. Uh, we had more than uh, for 405,000 people um, planting 2,000 trees in one day. It was the first big public event in January, and it is supported and financed by the climate adaptation life lens. Next slide, please. Here, the example of our first green corridor. It uh, connected the city center uh, with the, the main uh, Monsanto forest park, which is a 1,000 uh, hectares forest park planted by hand during the 40s. It is making nine decades now. And we have created this, as you can see, a big difference. It was places, there were places for derelict land, use it for uh, random car parks. And we have uh, removed all these and created two uh, pedestrian bridges and lots of interesting um, uses for this. Next slide, please. This is the beginning of, of the Green Corridor. It's uh, the viewpoint over the, the, the city center of the, the city. And when you're looking behind, we put this, this bridge. And next slide, please. And we go to the rain-fed rain biodiversity middle that is import also uh, and, and uh, it's it, it balanced with private land, which is mandatory to become green in the master plan. Next slide, please. And it was a huge transformation. Uh, all the trees were planted since the beginning by citizens during several uh, events of planting trees. This is the picture of the first one. Next slide, please. This is a major bridge. It was definitely important to overcome uh, a six lane road that we had here. And you see at the bottom, the, the for Monsanto Mountain Forest Park that is become very, very, very close. Next slide, please. And here we started to make uh, a crop field in the middle of the city. So we created a partnership with uh, a crop field union representing several companies that uh, works with cereal and we made next slide please we made a mixed use park when we have we had a, a, a crop field and recreation side by side and it was very interesting because people could see the the this transformation of the landscape the nature in the landscape next slide and that's the picture of uh, another uh, plantation trees. This is our last slide. We have more four uh, green corridors open so far, and we are working hard to close the, all the green corridors. It was intended to do it uh, in the next year, but it will happen starting everything next, the rest ne next year. And we are going to finish everything in 2023, the latest one, it will represent 15% uh, more green spaces in a consolidated uh, uh, city, which is very, very impressive. Uh, it will represent almost 100 million euro investment since the beginning across 10 years of implementation. Thank you very much.
again. <laughs> Sorry for the slight delay. Um, thank you so much, Dorothy. And again, I mean, very impressive what just the numbers you said at the end, um, kind of the efforts of the last 10 years and really seeing it all coming together with 30% increase of green spaces. So congratulations. Um, I can imagine a lot of work, but it's beautiful now to see all these green spaces popping up. Um, we are going to move now to the panel discussion because we're a bit short on time. So I'm going to hand it over to Flori to show us a video of yet another city with green corridors. And then she's going to lead a discussion between the panelists to, to um, ask us our questions. So thanks so much and over to you, Flori. Thank you very much, Regina. And thank you to all the speakers. It's been amazing. Um, to, to hear everything you had to share. And also there are so many different questions and I could see how we could easily go on for hours and hours talking about this subject. Um, before we move into the panel discussion, we wanted to share just a one minute video um, from our friends in Madrid who couldn't be with us today, uh, but they wanted to share with us what they are up to when it comes to green corridors. Um, enjoy. Trees are life. They absorb CO2 and they give us back oxygen. That's why it's becoming increasingly important to ensure that our cities have green spaces. We're aware that climate change is a reality. And now, more than ever before, we need to take action to combat it. We in Madrid City Council have a dream and we are going to make that dream come true. We are going to create a major green infrastructure, a metropolitan forest that will encircle the entire city. A green ring that will absorb 171,000 tons of CO2. So you can enjoy nature in your own environment. And be part of it. because we want a sustainable and green Madrid. A city where you breathe life. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so we're now going to move into the panel discussion. I will be asking all our speakers to unmute yourselves and share your camera if possible as well. Um, and for our attendees, you could put us on gallery view um, so that you can see all the speakers. Um, and I wanted to start with the question for Mar and Duarte. Maybe we can start with Mar and then with Duarte. Um, the question is, how did you enjoy, uh, engage your, your local community? Um, and for those people who maybe weren't buying in the idea, how did you convince them? Well, you go out in the street and you talk to your local uh, green grocer, you talk to your local, um, the parents in the schools, the librarian, you start talking to everybody. Um, when I started the first Little Peak event um, in March 2018, what I did was just to tell everybody and tell everybody who knows everybody. And out of all that talk that happened for a, a good, possibly two months, uh, 30 people turned up. And I thought that I was like super successful because I thought it was going to be me, my kids and my husband and three friends. Um, all considered a little bit loopy. But I think what happened is we have lost the the, the, the ability to talk to people. And when people talk to you in the middle of the street because you're doing something, you think, thank goodness that somebody has talked to me because we've lost that react action and reaction to things. So people throw things in the street and nobody tells them anything. What we did was to kind of empower ourselves to say, actually, I'm not going to put up with this. The street is my home, my home as well. So when you have that attitude and then you're backed by the people that you are with in a community group, for instance, then you think actually you just talk to, you just continue talking and you kind of start making sense of how things become part of what you are, the identity as a group. And then you connect with other groups, like-minded groups, because then you don't feel like you're isolated. 
somebody in the uh, in the chat was saying, how do you then uh, make your profile higher? And you, it's, so, it's by social media. I mean, social media is kind of makes you coming out of isolation and makes you realize actually, not only we are going to plant trees, but we are going to be watering them. Who wants to be watering what trees in our streets? And, and by in doing so, I think we empower a lot of people who may otherwise have been lost in, in the mire of, you know, other, other conversations that are not relevant for our groups, for instance. Thank you very much, Mar. Um, over to you, Duarte, for the same question. Uh, well, um, I, I have to be honest that uh, we we had always uh, big support from people, and we were this born in, from several this idea born from uh, several decades of uh, uh, citizenship uh, movements, and but it was uh, uh, top down because it only started when the politicians. Uh, elected by these movements uh, arrived here in the municipality. The deputy mayor, Safranj, representing ecological movements from, from, from this idea. And it was never uh, understood for most part of the city as very interesting until people started to see in field. So it was very important, this first corridor that you seen, have seen in my presentation, because it opened the gates to the replication very easily. And now, it is, uh, it is something that ev everyone uh, um, understands that it's very important. But before that, it was very, very theoretical. This idea of ecological continuity, people didn't see that. They didn't understand how, how useful it could be. The, the same for urban allotment. And now we are tackling uh, the, 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 some resistance to the biodiversity because these uh, ideas of urban biodiversity they clash with the, the, the boutique landscape, you know, the, the flowering, the very beautiful uh, conventional landscape that is uh, so old fashioned because they don't provide the urban ecosystem service that we, we intend. And people like very much because they think that it is the first class uh, landscape and we are now providing wilderness and things that they sometimes uh, say that is second class landscape. And it is very important for us now um, using the green capital to bring more people to defend this because it is not safe. It is, it is not uh, uh, forever, this implementation. Sometimes they can be reverted if people uh, think that uh, it is more interesting to, to use other kind of approach in terms of landscape. Only a, a final uh, sense to say that we had several uh, defenders of this, including when we opened the participatory budget in 2009, and we had several proposals that won the participatory budget, and they were mandatory. And we had implementing part of this project with mandatory projects born from, from the movements. So it was, it was very important in that time for us. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move on to the next question, which was for Paula, but actually I would love to hear from all the speakers. Um, how are you managing the long-term maintenance of the sites? Because the more successful you are in transforming sites, the more sites there are to maintain. Um, so if Paula, if you could go first and then Peter maybe after. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, thanks. So one, one of the important things is when we made this kind of projects of green corridors, we're planting trees and plants who don't need a lot of water. So they can be able to, in part of a way, uh, to maintain themselves with the, with the raining in the city. Sometimes in dry seasons, we water in them and also we use the metro system canalization to, to use the, um, the raining water to water in the plants. But this is one thing that we think uh, bef uh, before planting this kind of plants, 
because maintain is very expensive. So the city doesn't have a lot of budget to do the maintain. So we try to plant in resistant plants or plants who can be uh, in a good condition with natural um, in the with natural like to don't have to do a lot of maintain. But as I want to say is we have the budget is only for the municipality, even though the citizens helps, but the, the principal budget come from the municipality. Great, thank you. Peter? Um, I guess I want to say that, I mean, the issue of maintenance always comes up and people say, well, it's costly to maintain green infrastructure, but all infrastructure in city is, needs to be maintained and costs money. Um, whether it's our roads, our rail, our digital networks, they all cost money to maintain. And, and the thing we need to demonstrate is that investing in green infrastructure and maintaining good quality green infrastructure uh, actually has lots more benefits, has lots of health benefits, lots of benefits in terms of climate change resilience, and actually has an economic multiplier in the long term. So there's lots of work being done now on ecosystem services, on natural capital, demonstrating that investment in um, creating and maintaining green infrastructure is economically sensible thing to do for a city, just as we invest and, uh, and maintain schools and hospitals. Mm. Thank you. And Mar, I would love you to answer to this question as well, especially how do you keep engagement with your local community after you plant? What we've been doing, we've been not only engaging with the local community to look after the trees, for instance, um, but we've been also engaging with, for instance, in our case, with the London Borough of Hounslow and the, 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 the contractors who water the trees and we were we we have been saying in order for a tree to succeed, it needs to have at the very least, if it's a small tree, to be watered for three years. So we have now very expanded in London specifically. Very we've been having two very dry years, um, summers. So this summer we created a network of community tree waterers or tree water wardens by the community that we've been kind of infusing through our uh, WhatsApp group. And, and through Twitter, we've been saying, if anybody has a tree that looks a bit dying or thirsty, please water it. And, and it will take only one person to water one tree once a week for two, two months in summer. What we're doing, for instance, in, in a larger project like we're having in, in tree planting week um, in December, we have from the from the Woodland Trust, we have 30 trees, but they're not trees, they're just like twiglets. And, and the, the success rate of planting these trees, if you don't look after them, as we all know, is very is possibly half or even less. So what we've been doing is like in order for the council to let us plant 30 trees in a green space in certain playing fields where we want to create a community garden, is to make sure that the council can fence a little area so that what dog walkers are preventing from, you know, encourage their dogs to, to destroy the area. And then having the community, the people who actually walk the, the, the area to bring a little water every time that they can. So, but is what Peter was saying earlier about having um, dead landscapes so, or green, green um, areas of, of uninspiring green. What I think we need to be doing is trying to encourage the, the councils to plant in those trees, in those areas, because that way, A, you will have a more protected um, space where you can, um, with community groups, you can help water and you can help preventing um, you know, the death of, of, of young trees. And once that they establish, then is when it would happen when they can look after themselves. Um, with the rainy season, but I think if we don't look after them, all of them when they're very small, then we kind of only plant trees, but we don't um, protect the trees and we don't look after them. So I think I think the, the, the tree planting is fantastic, but the tree survival depends on how the community, not only the councillors, because the council, they have a, a budget for water. That's fine. So they can water when they can water, but then we could also be responsible or the, the, the individuals could be responsible for from watering our street trees, our green trees, an adopted tree project. They should be coming up like, we don't need to so much, we can, we do need to plant trees, but we need to preserve 
um, the uh, existing trees and, and and have more tree protection orders, even in people's own gardens. I mean, the people who own a house don't own necessarily or shouldn't be owning. This might be a slightly off, off, off tangent, but the trees planted in front gardens should be part, even if they belong on the land of the, of the people who own the homes, they should be trees that should be protected. Nobody owns those trees. No, new owners don't own those trees. So I leave it there. <laughs> We are running a little bit uh, behind the schedule, but I would love to hear from Duarte. And then I had one other quick question for all of you, and then we will wrap up. So um, over to you, Duarte. I'm just asking you to unmute yourself. Sorry, can you can you um, tell me again the, the question? Well, the the question one? was, how are you maintaining the sites? Because you've been obviously greening yeah, a yeah. lot. Uh, we've seen a lot happening on the map. So how yeah, are yeah. you maintaining those? Okay, sites? okay. So uh, this is the big the big challenge for us because uh, we don't have water and we are making not lots of landscape natural solutions. And so we are using lots of efforts to uh, plant very dense uh, forests. It, it is the, 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 the best way to, to, to guarantee uh, the best results. It's to make very dense, uh, small trees plantation. It's our latest orientation to do that. But, and we count with, with, with some of uh, uh, the performance of 60%, 70%. So we have losses in terms of trees and the rest of the places, we are making a very slow uh, in, um, success implementation. So the, the first stage is to, to win very large parts of the land. We plant trees, we make the, the paths, we create some specific um, uh, intensive uh, irrigated areas when we need it. And then that's the reason this is not ir ir irreversible. It can be because we are using few money to make bigger, biggest areas than we can use. We are making an average of 25 euros for square meter, which is very low compared with 75 euros for square meter that we can use in some intensive gardens. So we are dealing with the biodiversity and with time to explain people that things nature takes some time. And we are using some important campaigns, including explaining in fields why the landscape in the beginning cannot be so beautiful as you can have if you put water and you make the boutique solutions that we, we could use and we are not using. So it's the big challenge for us in the, in the forthcoming years. Thank you. And then a very quick question for all of you um, from Angelica. All these beautiful regeneration schemes have, have been done um, with local vegetation or did you use imported plants? Are you trying to reestablish the local ecosystem? Um, I know some of you touched on it, but I would love to quickly hear. Um, so can we start with Paula? Okay, yeah, thank you. So yes. Here in Medellin, we use the local vegetation that we have. This is the one vintage that, that in the tropical countries that we have a lot of kind of species. We have small, big one, medium. So we think of a, a list of, I think, around 50 kind of species, which are locally. Doesn't mean they're endemic, that they have been in the city for a long time, more than one century. And uh, we use them to recreate a urban ecosystem in the city. Also uh, thinking about the vertical stratus, like small plants, medium, and the higher plants, or like in this case of trees. So well, yes, we don't use external, we use also, because everything was from local trees. Thank you. Peter, can we hear from you now? So, so it's a mix, it depends on the project. So where possible, and particularly where we're trying to promote biodiversity, we will use native species, although they're not locally produced, there's not enough uh, production at a local level to supply needs in London. Um, but in many other projects, it's a mix of non-native species as well. Uh, in many urban locations, a non-native species 
will uh, provide um, valuable habitat uh, and can work better in some circumstances, particularly in, in highly urbanized areas. Thank you. What about your community work, Mar? I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yes. Um, well, beggars can be choosers and we don't have a budget. So in our community, what we've been doing is um, we've been having um, trees donated by the Woodland Trust for the past three or four years. At the moment, we've been nursing them in our homes, in our gardens, in the in waiting for a community garden to then put them in larger pots and then they, we can distribute it to people who want to have them. Um, we're having, as I mentioned before, a, a tree planting event, again from the Woodland Trust. We needed permission from the council to, to plant them. And we have a couple of um, guerrilla planters, somebody who loves walnuts, and we want to plant a couple of walnuts in a street called Walnut, um, Walnut Tree Road. And, and we want to repopulate that road with walnut trees, if possible. So somebody's already kind of having shoots of, of, of grafting uh, walnut trees. In terms of whether they're native or not, um, the ones that we've been given by the Woodland Trust are native, I think Rowan and Wild Cherries. Um, the ones that we're trying, I'm trying to get a slightly Mediterranean here. So I have a fig tree waiting and a pomegranate um, and then maybe having crafted from sweet cherries from Spain, maybe next year in a couple of years to try to see if they take on from, from already planted native um, wild cherry trees. So we will be doing a little bit of experimentation there. Thank you. Um, you touched upon guerrilla gardening and I would have loved, we don't have time um, to ask the question, but I would have loved to know from you, what do you think about guerrilla gardening? Um, but I'll pass it on to Duarte just uh, to, to hear your answer in terms of the species, the native species. And then if you want to answer to the guerrilla gardening quickly, be my guest. <laughs> well, um... I have mixed feelings about the guerrilla gar um, gardens, but uh, I think some the the movements. I think in Lisbon in, today, you, we, you don't need to make that because we are making lots of biodiversity landscapes that are made of lots of the seeds that could be put in that. Um, how do you say the bombs that using like the guerrilla movements use a lot? You are using it. Uh, so it's official, so it doesn't make a little sense, but today, but uh, in the past it, it happened in the city, it was important in some movements to to win some local battles. About the native species, it makes part of our process of nature-based solutions. For instance, the, that is the, the secret for the rain-fed meadows, that they are specific studied species from our climate here, the best to resilient and uh, the best adapted to the specific soils and our climate to resist. In terms of, of trees, all the green corridors are based on the native species as, soon as, as far as possible. Sometimes we have some good adapted species that are some botanicals, uh, include them in the almost native because they are here for so many times and they are so well adapted. We have also um, uh, a very restrictive list of forbidden species because they are invasive, so we cannot even use it. In, in, the, in the small gardens, it's more usual to use uh, species from, from, the, from the catalogs of, of beautiful plants and uh, it's different. The trees, in alignment trees, sometimes they are, they are not native because sometimes they are the best solution from that specific place. Great, thank you so much. Um, we will be closing the event because we ran over 10 minutes. Thank you so much to all the speakers. It's been amazing. I would have loved to continue this conversation. Um, thank you to Regina for hosting. Thank you to Ed for helping us with the tech. Um, I would love to continue this conversation about London. So if anyone wants, um, to, to speak to us, um, I'll, I'll write the email in the chat. Um, part of our Rangers program, this was the theme that um, got the most votes. So 
all the rangers in London, they want to prioritize green corridors. But then we also knew that it's such a big theme that we need to kind of kickstart with the conversation and just learn um, what is already happening in London, what is happening in other cities across the world, and then how can us as local communities work with local authorities and the GLA as well to, to push this. So it would be great to have a conversation with Peter, uh, with, with our rangers, but also if anyone watching this would like to be part of the conversation, um, do let us know. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. There are still loads of uh, questions that haven't been answered. So um, we will see if our speakers, I know they're very busy, if they have time, um, maybe like in the next few days to look at some of those questions, um, we would very much appreciate and we will be sending a follow-up email. Um, have, good, have good evenings. I think Paola, it's still daytime um, in Medellin. Um, so thank you, thank you to everyone once again um, and keep doing the amazing work you're doing.